This is Friday, December 1st, 2017. We are in Beverly, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and we are privileged to have with us today Dan Callanan. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? December 15th, 1924. And where were you born? Malden, Massachusetts. What, uh, what community do you currently live in? Beverly Cove. Your marital status? Married. Do you have children? Yes. Two. Two. Any grandchildren? Two. Great-grandchildren? None. And tell us about Malden growing up. It was a busy city. Uh, five miles north of Boston, it's sort of a transportation hub for the nearby, adjacent communities. And what did your father do for a living? He was the Ford dealer in Malden until the war came along when they stopped making cars. And what did he do during the war? Worked for General Electric's supercharged division which is part of the jet engine in Everett. Now, Dan, did you go to schools in Malden? Yes. I went to the parish school called Chevrolet Centennial School for eight years, and then I went to Malden Catholic High School. While you were attending a school, were you made aware of events happening overseas? Big time, yes. Uh, particularly in high school, we had the Zaverian brothers did a great job of keeping us up to date on what was happening, and also of picking out the uh, kids from that were not of Irish background and, and making points of the fact that, you know, Italy was involved in the war and we had Italian kids in the class and that sort of stuff. They, they, they did a great job of pointing out that we were a diversified nation made up of people from other parts of the world. So they didn't pick on the Italian kids? No, no, but no. they were, I just use that as an example. Oh. Mm -hmm. And do you remember what you were doing when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor? Yes. Uh, I was a backup guy for our school's representative at the Archdiocesan Oratorical Contest at Boston College. And uh, I didn't participate because uh, we had a good man, John Nicholson, that was representing the school. And the announcement came during that that morning. <clears throat> and what were you thinking? Uh, not very much. I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. When did you graduate from Alden Catholic? 1943. And what were you doing in those intervening years? Did you take part in home front activities? In what? In home front activities such as scrap drives? No. No? When and where did you enter the military? Boston. And what year? 1943. I volunteered on my 18th birthday, which was December 15th, 1942. But the Marine Corps insisted on giving everybody a good training, and they were full. And I thought that maybe the Boston office quota had been filled. So I went up to Manchester, New Hampshire, and tried to join there. But they were full. They, they said it was really Paris Island that was full. So it was until February 9th. I waited from December 15th to February 9th on almost a day-to-day -day basis to try to get into the Marine Corps uh, before the war was over. That was my thought, you know, got to get, get in and out. Okay, Dan, why the Marine Corps? My father had been in the Marine Corps in World War I. And with five boys, he... Uh, had his own platoon. Really? Uh, did your father see any action? No, no. Uh, he never left the States. Philadelphia, big ambulance driver during the flu epidemic down there. An experience in itself. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you finally get into the Marines. Yes. Tell us uh, what the first days were like. Boot camp. Okay, and you were down in Paris Island. Yes. And tell us what that was like. Well, it's pretty well known what boot camp's like. 
uh, a lot of close water drill. Discipline, you certainly learned the basics, the do as you're told, go where you're being sent, and that sort of stuff. Was this the first time you were away from Massachusetts? Yeah. So yes. you were, was this like the first time you were meeting guys from other parts of the country? Yes. And what was that like? An experience, I remember one fellow arrived in his bare feet, no shoes. No his shoes. Name, his name was Jefferson Davis. Don't tell me he was from Mississippi. Well, but I forget where in the South, but. Uh, well, I certainly hope the Marines at least gave him some shoes. They did, and he got blisters right away. And hated them. Okay. Now, Dan, uh, tell us a little more about the uh, boot camp training. Did you receive any uh, specialized training? No. No? So how long was boot camp? I think it was uh, I, it's supposed to be 10 weeks, I believe. Mm -hmm. But we had an outbreak of spinal, of what, what was it? Spinal mind, ma Meningitis? Spinal, yeah. And for that reason, we were sent out in the woods and quarantined from the rest of the group for, I don't know, a week or two. So it's a little bit longer than usual. So that brings us to spring of 1943, yeah. around that time? Well, Pensacola was June, July, August, and September. Okay. And it's a week or two at Cherry Point, North Carolina, after boot camp before going to Pensacola. That was sort of mm -hmm. sorting, sorting things out. And uh, what did you do down in Pensacola? It was Naval School of Photography. Were you interested in photography, or did the Marines feel that you're, you could be best suited there? I will say both. Okay. Did you ever handle a camera before then? Yes. Okay. But not none of this none of this aerial stuff. Okay. So it's like the middle of 1943. And before we uh, proceed with that, were you given up regular updates of what was happening um, overseas? Oh sure. Mm -hmm. Day for day, yeah. And what was uh, the way you got your news? Radio, newspapers? Uh, actually, it was the, our drill instructor would give us a because we didn't have any radio or newspapers. So he'd give you the news. Yep. Okay, let's get you to Pensacola, and tell us a little bit about Pensacola in those days. It was intensive training. By that word, I mean. Uh, Full, you know, every minute was accounted for. Uh, <clears throat> now, what did you, what were you learning in Pensacola? The first thing, as I mentioned, we had 16 weeks, four months, three months, four months. The first month was basically dark room and basics of photography and uh, composition and that sort of stuff. The second month was actually with a camera, like a press photographer, and this idea of working distortion. We talked about that earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was basically architectural photography. The third month was aerial photography, and the fourth month was movies. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little more about the cameras uh, you were using, say for the still mm -hmm. photographer. With the what? With still photography, well, uh, what kind of camera were you using? Well, we had speed graphics uh -huh. and a medalist. And then we moved into the aerial photography stuff was, you know, was F8 and F16 and that stuff that doesn't mean much to you, F56 is most of the time. Um, on the movies, we uh, had a lot of them, a lot of cameras. I can't remember them. Okay, uh, tell me uh, a bit about the size of the cameras, the shape. Well, a speed graphic is what you see news photographers use today. Uh, 
the area of photography was mostly a big handle on each side over the side of the plane or the big one in the center of the hole shooting down between your legs. Uh, movie cameras were both small, medium, and large. Uh, that's it. And Dan, what was the purpose of this training? Why were you being uh, trained as an aerial photographer? Well, I go back to the point that in the Marine Corps, you do as you're told and go where you're being sent. So it, in the photo school, we had all phases of photography. And, you know, you, you figure, I'm aerial photographer, but you also had other things to do. And sure enough, I was assigned to a fighter squadron, which is fighter planes, single cockpit, no back seat for a photographer. So what did I do? I ended up running gun cameras. A gun, uh, fighter planes have three 50 caliber machines, guns, in, three in each wing. And they're focused about 10,000 feet ahead of you, all converging at that point. We had to be sure the camera was focused at that point too. Now the camera had a, a cassette. And in addition to checking all the cameras every day, before every flight, I had to put the cat, uh, fresh film in and take the, fresh, the old film out and record because we flew, they flew in flights of four and all their maneuvers were centered around that idea of which one of the four positions they flew in and their cameras were usually pointed at a tow target, a blister, a windsock being towed by another plane. And that's what the camera was focused on. So I had to take the film out of the cameras and match them up with the other three in the same flight, process them and put them together on one long piece of film and uh, present that to the flight commander of, that four, of those four so he could review that film with his flying mates every day. And yeah. at the time you were stationed in Pensacola, what was your rank? Private. You were private, okay. And I graduated in the top 10% of the class, so I was automatically a corporal. I never was a private first class. I was a private to a corporal. Good for you. Well, it just happened. And again, how long were you stationed in Pensacola? 16 weeks. 16 weeks. And tell us what happened after that. Back to Cherry Point for reassignment. And as I said earlier, I was assigned to a fighter squadron, which didn't have any back seat for photographers, so I ended up doing the gun cameras. And where were you stationed? Uh, I joined a, the fighter squadron, which was first stationed in an outlying field from Cherry Point in Kinston, North Carolina, so that we could learn how to uh, survive by ourselves before we went overseas. And when we went overseas, uh, our squadron was sent to the island of Midway, Midway, right in the middle of the Pacific. And there we uh, did defense work for a, s a submarine base, which was f f kind of important for submarines. Not a very exciting place for us. Of course, the Battle of Midway having passed. And at sea. Yeah. At sea. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this was your first uh, time in the Pacific. What was that like? Besides hot. What was it like? I guess I would just say you just do as you're told and go where you're being sent. That's, none of us really enjoy Midway, but there are a lot of goonie birds on Midway. We enjoyed playing with them. And for those who don't know, what is a goony bird? Big seagull. Big seagull, okay. How... A liaison albatross. Mm -hmm. And how long were you stationed at Midway? 51 weeks. Nearly a year. And then we came back to Pearl because we had been there long enough to be rotated. And when we got back to Pearl, they said, we're gonna invade Japan. Everybody's a mud marine. Forget flying, think about jack in the mud. 
So we had a couple of days of that, and then they dropped the bomb on Pearl Harbor so on, on uh, Japan. So that ended that idea, and we were back in the States by Thanksgiving. Thank God. Indeed. Thanks for Harry Truman. Mm -hmm. So, Dan, when, um, when the bomb was dropped, were you still a corporal? Yeah, and I was discharged as a corporal. Uh -huh. I never got promoted after that. Okay. Do you, what else do you remember about your time out in the Pacific Theater? Not much. Okay. Except that you didn't have to invade Japan. It was a blessing. It was. Uh, you mean you didn't have to go out there as a combat marine. That's right. But you came close. So you were, uh, were you sent home to Boston? I think? Yes, yes. Okay. Sent home. I mm -hmm. sat up in a day coach all the way. Now, during your time in the Marines, uh, did you write regularly to your family? Yes, yes. Now, I understand you had some younger brothers. Yes. But they, uh, they, they too kind young. Of, too yeah. young. Okay. Did they uh, serve in the military? Uh, Jack served. Uh, Liz's father served in the Navy. A actually, he was a graduate of the Mass Maritime Academy, which automatically gave him a, a commission in the Navy. And when the Eisenhower pulled the, that deferment out from them, he had to go on active duty and was made operations officer of the Rhine River Patrol, which got him acquainted with beer. I hope it was good beer. I don't know. <laughs> Let's get back to you, and you're heading back to Boston just in time for the holidays, 1945? Yes. Okay. Uh, were you still in the Marines? Yes. When were you discharged? April 29th, 1946. Okay. And were you uh, stationed anywhere until you... North Carolina. You're back in North Carolina. Okay. Cherry Point. Doing a little bit of uh, coastal geodetic surveys, but that was minor, just three trips, that's all. <clears throat> okay, Jack, uh, excuse me, Dan. Okay, so uh, you were discharged out of Cherry Point? Yes. And you came back to Boston? Yes. Tell us what happened uh, after the war. Well, we were entitled to the GI Bill, which meant we could go back to school. In my case, it meant going back to high school. I had dropped out of high school. Oh. In Remember, I had a birthday in December mm -hmm. and was in the Marine Corps on February 9th, so okay. I had to go back to high school. And, and to do that, I went to Medford High, had a program for veterans to get caught up to date. And I went there in the morning and then took the bus into Huntington Prep on, in Boston for the afternoon and then to Newman Prep at night. And I did that for a full year of uh, morning, afternoon, and evening. But I caught up with my, reviewed my whole high school, and then started Boston College. And what was your major at Boston College? It's called the Classics, Latin and Greek. It's a waste of time. Did you have any idea what you would eventually do? No, but I thought I was going into the business school and I was accepted, but I had an aunt who taught Latin and thought we all ought to learn Latin and I had to do as I was told. So that's why I ended up with Latin and Greek. Did you eventually get back into business school? No, I never did. Oh. So when, uh, when did you graduate from BC? 40, what is it, 52. 52. Had you married by that time? No, 54. 54, okay. During the time, of course, the latter part of Boston College was, of course, the Korean conflict. Uh, were you approached or were you thinking about going back? No. 
Okay. What happened after you graduated? I, while I was at BC, I got a job as a reporter for the Boston Post, which was a New England's leading newspaper at that time for circulation. And uh, when I graduated, I kept there at the post for a few more months. And then it began to get rusty and was about to fold. So I joined a company which had a trade paper in Boston, and they ultimately moved me to New York for their headquarters. And what kind of trade paper was it? Well, in Boston, it was a uh, self service was just beginning for supermarkets. Mm -hmm. And it was f f a tabloid newspaper for them. In New York, it was Sales Management Magazine. And how long were you in New York? About 15 years. Tell us a bit about New York uh, at that period. Well, uh, we lived in out in Greenwich, Connecticut, so it was a sub. It was a train ride in five days a week, and. Uh, in my case, it was mostly walking around Madison Avenue areas, uh, getting people to advertise in our magazine. And then ultimately, as I became national sales manager, I began traveling the country a lot. Too much, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I had a chance to come back to Boston, thanks to a brother who knew of an opening at Honeywell. And what did you do for Honeywell? They call it the Director of Communications, which is advertising, merchandising, public relations, and all that, government, all that sort of stuff. And how long were you with Honeywell? How, how long, Betty? <laughs> I don't remember. Being... All right, let me just try to think. 69 until... Back to Boston. Yeah, 69, but when did I leave? 90s. I don't know. So. I can't remember. No, okay. Well, you were there for 20, mm -hmm. 20 years plus, right? Mm -hmm. We'll call it the 90s. So what are you doing these days? Enjoying my retirement, thanks to a very good nurse here. There was all the work, all the driving. Mm -hmm. I came just in time. <laughs> now, Dan, uh, did you uh, do any reunions? Did you join any service organizations? I was, while well, I was with Honeywell, I represented the company at the Boston Rotary and at the uh, Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. Okay. And how about uh, VFW, American Legion? None. None? And no reunions or anything like that? No. No? Okay. And did your children uh, go into the military? No. Any of your other brothers? I mentioned Jack going into the Navy. Yep. Mm -hmm. And both Joe and Pete uh, would spend time in the Army. Okay. Dan, is there anything else uh, you, that you recall about your time in the Marine Corps? I enjoyed it, you know, considering there was a war on and what other people my age were doing. Uh, I, re, I never did see combat, so I can't talk about that. But the big thing is you do as you're told and you go where you're being sent. How important was it for you to serve in the military? Well, I think at that time, it was very important. After all, our country had been attacked. And that's why I was determined to spend my military time in the Pacific, not the other way. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we finish up this interview? Just as there were two world wars, the Pacific and the European. Okay. And Dan Callanan, we thank you so much for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. You're welcome. <laughs>